Well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, nice to hear some uh, hear some folks in BC. Um, I guess I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Mike Burrell. I I'm out here in Ontario. I work for Bird Studies Canada um, as the coordinator for the Ontario IBA program, and then I do um, some of the national technical support for the IBA program uh, in Canada. Uh, and um, I've been really into eBird for quite a while, uh, so it kind of blends well with with the IBA program and how we're we're trying to get um, the data recording to be done straight through eBird to sort of streamline data collection um, for updating site summaries and things like that. So that's uh, that's me. Um, I, I think um, yeah, we sent out the rough outline of of what we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to go through an intro to eBird, what the incentives are for using eBird, um, and then how we can use eBird for IBA monitoring. I'm going to really quick mention um, mobile recording with for eBird um, using cell phones, uh, and then how do we use eBird and access the data to update site summaries and things like that. And then there will be lots of time at the end for uh, for questions, and along the way, um, if you have if you have a question about something, uh, I think the easiest thing is to type it in in the the chat little little chat box. Um, that's part of the the sidebar that you can pop in and out, um, and that way we can leave everybody's mics muted unless you want to ask a question. Um, I I can mute your microphones, or if you can. Uh, mute them on your end, that works too, but uh, it'll just hopefully prevent as much feedback as we could possibly get. Does that sound, uh, sound good, Krista and everybody else? Yep. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, um, I'm going to, I'm going to mute everybody. Um, so if you want to ask a question, uh, just type it into the, the chat, or or you can say, um, you can just type in the chat that you have a question and I can unmute your microphone. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, I mentioned it already once, but um, we're gonna re we're, we are recording this session so that we can let other people watch it and, uh, and it'll be a good resource for other caretakers uh, around the country. So you're forewarned that you're being recorded. Okay, so everybody can still hear me. Uh, if, if you can't hear me, type into the chat, but uh, I think I did it properly. So um, we're going to talk about eBird. Um, so I wanted to run through uh, a quick introduction to eBird. Um, so if you've never been to the eBird website, um, you can get to it on any web browser just by typing www ebird.ca. That's the that's the eBird Canada homepage. Um, you can use just ebird.org if if that's what you want to go to. Uh, but we prefer you to use ebird.ca because it'll give you Canada specific news here on the homepage. And there are some options that are only available if you if you're using the eBird Canada uh, portal. So when you go to eBird. This is the, the home page, and it's got news items here. Uh, we try to put on new new news items um, it's f fairly regularly. There are things like tips on how to use eBird better, um, announcements related to eBird, uh, announcements to new features, which are always getting new features added to eBird. So there's lots of, of information posted here every, every couple weeks kind of thing. Uh, there's a little bit of information on the side side tab here, or the side of uh, the home page, with the top checklist submissions. So this is um, you're going to hear from me a lot today about the the ways eBird has come up with to get people to submit more information, and and one of the ways they've done it is to try to is to try to um, sort of play on people's competitiveness. Uh, so here you can see how 
your part of Canada is doing compared to other parts of Canada. So Metro Vancouver has submitted 1,800 eBird checklists uh, this month, uh, so j just this April. Uh, and down, you know, you can see where you rank, your area ranks uh, for the top areas of Canada anyways. So there's a few other tools along the side here as well. Okay, so that's the, uh, the eBird homepage, and then there's five tabs along the top here, uh, Home, Submit, Explore, My eBird, and Help. So the Help is a really good place to go if you have a question about eBird. Um, it's, it's, you, can, you can go to the Help tab, and you can type in a question, and there's often answers to those questions already. Um, so, and, there, and just on the main Help page, there's common questions about how to get started with eBird. So I'll go back to the home. Um, now these other three are fairly self-explanatory. Submit is where you're going to go to submit information. We're, we're going to save that for last. Uh, the, ne the next two tabs are Explore and My eBird. So the, the, the way eBird has been successful in getting people to submit information is it, it started first as as a way eBird started with the the hopes that people would just be out of the goodness of their heart um, they'd be willing to spend effort and time to submit information into eBird but um, that was successful a little bit but it wasn't very successful there was you know there's a small group of dedicated people that are are willing to put a lot of effort in but most uh, most of the people out there that could be submitting information, uh, they needed some sort of incentive. So eBird has built all these different incentives uh, into the program that are really successful at getting people involved and getting people to provide not just some information, but a lot of information and a lot of uh, high quality information in, in a lot of cases. So some of those incentives I'm going to run through quickly. Um, and we're going to start with the My eBird incentives. So I'm going to click My eBird. Um, I guess even before I mention that, I should mention to get some of these um, incentives, you have to sign up. You need a user account, which is free. You just need to pick a username, and uh, you need an email address to have associated with the account. But I've already signed in. Um, so I'm going to go to My eBird. And the My eBird is really a dashboard of your your personal stats. So eBird keeps all these things for you um, just by you submitting information and it calculates things like your life list. Uh, it keeps track of how many species you've seen this year or this month, uh, how many checklists you've submitted, and then it also breaks those lists down into several major regions by country, by state or province, and by county. Um, and eBird calls the, them counties because uh, that's what they call them in most of the United States. Um, what the what the counties are in Canada are the census census divisions. So uh, in Ontario, a lot of them are counties, but uh, in other places um, in Canada, they don't call them counties. Um, so that's why you saw things like uh, Metro Vancouver on that on the homepage there. So all these numbers that are blue are numbers that you can actually click on. So uh, it, it's a lot of a lot of birders. They really love keeping all sorts of lists, uh, and it's not just useful if you like keeping lists uh, for knowing how many species you've seen. But it, I find it really handy um, to be able to use those lists to go back and look up observations. So um, I'll show you an example here. I'll bring up my Ontario list. So I'm going to click on my Ontario list. Because it's blue, it's something I can click on. And so what it does is it lists my first sighting of each species, where it was, and when I saw it. And the default is to sort by taxonomy. I could sort alphabetically by species, or by location, or by date. So if I want to see you know, what was the most recent species I added to my Ontario list, Way down at the bottom here, there was a thick-billed mirror that I went and saw in Kingston on December 4th. 
So that, that keeps track of that information, but it's also really nice for common species. Uh, so if you wanted to bring up, say, a list of all the times you've seen black-throated blue warbler or any other species, you could click the species name, and eBird will, depending on how fast your internet is, uh, will bring up a list of all the records of black-throated blue. So I've reported in Ontario black or blue warbler 241 times. And each of those records I can bring right up. If I wanted to see what else I saw, I could just click on the date. Let's see what I saw last May 5th. So here's my list. And this is the, the things that eBird calls checklists. We'll go through what a checklist is in a little bit. Uh, but it'll show you what else I reported that same day. So I had a pretty good day. I had 102 species in six hours. Um, so it's, it's a really handy way to keep all of your own personal records nicely organized. Um, and it's, it's nice, you can click on a location name and it'll bring up a list of all the birds you've seen at that list. So here's my Peely Island list, for instance. Um, so it's, it's fun if you're, you know, if you want to do it for your yard or your neighborhood or a, a park or an IBA. Um, it will keep your a personal list of records uh, and you can go back and say, oh, yeah, I remember um, that green wing teal uh, back on September 9th. Or you might see a bird coming through your yard and you want to go see uh, when were the other times you saw a bird on your yard. You could use eBird to do those sorts of things. So that's a big incentive um, for, for personal use is it will keep all your personal stats like that for you. Now, there's a lot of other uh, sort of incentives that eBird has built in, and a lot of them are under the Explore Data option. So we're going to go there. So under Explore Data, there's all sorts of ways you can explore the eBird data. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that's been really successful in getting more people to use eBird is, again, I was talking about um, trying to trying to sort of key in on the, the competitive aspect that some people enjoy about bird watching. And so they've built this thing called the Top 100. Uh, I'll pull that up. And so the Top 100, you could go and say, okay, um, show me a list. Uh, how, how am I doing compared to the other bird watchers in, in Canada? Or I could select Ontario, or I could select um, the county. Uh, that I want, but I so I'll just pull up Canada here, and so it starts. It shows you a list of who's seen the most species in 2014. It gives me how I'm doing. So I'm I've ranked 31 on uh, on the eBird Top 100 right now with 143 species, and there's my most recent species was Vesper Sparrow, and that was yesterday. So you can see, okay, who's who's doing better than me? You can figure out where you are and figure out how many more species you need to see if you want to move up in the rankings. Uh, and if, if you don't want to do comp compete with species, you could look at checklists and see how you're doing. So I'm doing better for checklists uh, than I was for species. I'm I'm in fifth place. So this is uh, you know if you don't care about that sort of thing, then you don't need to pay any attention. But um, it's important to know it's there because that's. That's been one of the big reasons that eBird has been really successful in growing uh, is these, these incentives. Uh, and a lot of those incentives um, are, are looking at how to, how to spur kind of the, ins the competitive nature that some people enjoy about bird watching. So the information that goes into eBird, and there's a lot of it, um, in Ontario, as an example, we, we get about 400 checklists submitted every single day. So it, it works out to about a million bird records are submitted into eBird through the course of a year in Ontario. And it's been growing, uh, especially in the last three or four years, as a lot of these, these, uh, com these incentive tools have been built. It's been growing uh, basically exponentially. And BC has really seen... Um, really good eBird use as well. Um, Ontario and BC make up 
probably about three quarters of all the the bird records in eBird. Um, so there's 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 kind of needs to be a, a tipping point with the eBird information being submitted. Once there's enough information in the system, then it can produce really high quality outputs, and then that kind of inspires more people to use it because they see how powerful it is. So I'm going to use uh, for a lot of these examples of of how you can explore the data. I'm going to use Ontario because that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, BC would be pretty similar as far as the quality of the output tools because of how much information is there. So I'm going to go through a couple of these explore data options um, and anybody can use these options. Uh, you don't even need to sign into eBird. You just need to go to the website and you can you can explore the information. So the first thing I'm going to um, use is this bar chart creator. So the bar chart, uh, a lot of you will probably be familiar with the idea of a seasonal bird checklist. And the seasonal bird checklist, um, it'll, it'll give you, for a, for a given area, it'll tell you what species have been found there. And it will, looking at the bar across for the season, it'll tell you when you're most likely to see that species. So you need to tell eBird what area you want a bar chart for. So you can choose, uh, you can't choose all of Canada because it's so big and there's so much information, but you can choose a province. Um, so we could choose Ontario. I'm actually going to not choose Ontario. I'm going to choose British Columbia. And once you click on British Columbia, it'll, it'll let you select any of these other subregions. So you can see you could you could click entire region to see a bar chart for all of BC. You could click counties if you wanted to see those political subdivisions of BC. Um, you could use hotspots and hotspots in eBird. They're not necessarily uh, birding hotspots in the traditional sense that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, they could be uh, any kind of public birding area or birding areas that more than one person regularly goes to. Um, so if you clicked any of these subregions, it will give you an option further on uh, to, to select which of those subregions you want. Uh, bird conservation regions, um, you'll be familiar with, uh, or you might be familiar with the, the different bird conservation regions um, throughout North America. Uh, and then the last option, which is really handy for, for us that are working in the IBA program, is the important bird areas option. So any in North America, you can you can use IBAs. They're all built into the system, which is, is really great. So I'm going to use the IBA option. And I could also make a bar chart for, um, for one of my personal locations. So if you wanted to create a bar chart for your yard, you could do that. Um, no problem. So I'm going to select important bird areas and click continue. And now let's see. I want to pick something. Let's do Boundary Bay. Okay, so hit continue. Now here, so here's the uh, here's the bar chart for Boundary Bay IBA. Now uh, this will look familiar if you're if you're uh, if you've spent a lot of time on the IBA Canada website and looking at the site summaries. This will look really familiar to you um, as a refresher. Uh, where where we got it here? So let's. Just bring it up just to show you how similar they are. So here is the site summary on the IBA Canada website. And you'll notice the seasonal abundance chart here. And we have this made up for all the IBAs in Canada. So you can click that and it will open up a bar chart that looks really similar to, to this guy here. There are some differences. Um, so this bar chart here uses not just eBird data. It uses eBird data and all the other um, data that we have available in the Nature Counts database at Bird Studies Canada. And it also includes things that aren't birds. Um, so down at the bottom, there's often, oh, this one's all just birds. But on some of them, if we have data about frogs or butterfly species, they'll be included in this as well. So the bar chart, going back into to the eBird bar chart, um, it's got the list of species and it tells you what time of year you're most likely to see that species. So snow goose you can see is pr 
pretty pretty common right through the winter and then by late May is when it starts to disappear. There's a few scattered reports through the summer and then sort of mid-September they, they start moving in and then they're there in, in pretty good numbers right through the rest of the, the winter. And then compare that to, um, to tundra swan, which is just sort of uncommon through that, so that same sort of time period. Or we could go down and uh, where's another species here? Here's blue-winged teal. You can see they sort of start arriving really right around this time of the year. Uh, and then they peak kind of in, in May and June, and then they disappear kind of mid to late October. So it's a really handy resource. Um, and you can click the map option for any of these species, or if you click the species name, you'll get a little more information. So I'm going to click um, Snow Goose. So here's uh, the snow goose. I clicked it. So we've got the bar chart up at the top. And then it's going to have several different tabs here. Um, the first, the tab that opens up first is frequency. And frequency is what the bar charts are based on as well. So what frequency is, is it's basically, if you think about, uh, a if you think for the time period, 100, say 100 checklists were submitted. Um, now here's the example for the week starting on April 8th, the frequency is 20. And what that means is for the week starting on April 8th, if there were 100 checklists submitted, 20 of them would have snow goose reported on it, regardless of the number. It could be one, it could be 10,000. So 20% of checklists at that time of the year would have snow goose on it. Now there's these other tabs along the top and they give other different types of information. So uh, if you wanted to get an idea how many birds per hour of effort, uh, we see the same thing the week of March 8th. Uh, the average for an hour of effort would see 3,710.146 snow geese. Um, if you wanted to get an idea what the average count is, there's, there's that tab. High counts, so the high count in the spring is 20,000, which was happening in late March. In the fall, they get even more, 30,000. And then the totals is just adding together all the different reports. So it's, it's not the totals tab isn't that useful uh, for most people. Now, if we wanted to click the map, uh, we would click this button right here. So I'm going to click it, and we'll see a map of snow goose reports in that area. So you can see all these uh, blue and orange markers, um, and there's a there's the legend here on the, the right. So you can see the orange sightings are anything that's recent, which eBird considers recent as within the last 30 days. And then anything in blue are older records. And then if they have a, a flame on them, that's the birding hotspot that I mentioned earlier that are um, places that more than one person is likely to report from. So you can uh, when you're looking at this this map, if you want to zoom in, you can zoom in by clicking the plus sign here or zooming out with the minus sign here. If you have a mouse that has a wheel on it, uh, it's really handy. You can just use the mouse wheel to zoom in or zoom out. Um, and then the, the third option for zooming is to use the little magnifying glass. If you click it once and then click and drag an area, it will zoom in on that square. So any of these points are represent records that have been submitted to eBird by uh, a volunteer eBird user. So you can click on any of them. Let's click on this one right here. And this will give you all the sightings that happened at that location. So this was the Roberts Bank hotspot. And so you can see there's a, a big list of different people that have reported here. Uh, it tells you when they reported the information how many they reported. So you can enter an X. We'll talk about that uh, when we're talking about submitting information. But you can enter an X just to indicate presence. Um, or you can enter a count, the name of the observer. And then there's this checklist button. And you can click those checklists 
to bring up more information about what else they saw. And there will be, beside the checklist button, there will often be um, another marker of some type. So here there's a pencil mark. That means that this person uh, on their checklist, they included some notes associated with the, with the snow goose. So let's open up that checklist to see what they wrote. So by clicking that checklist link, we are taken to the full checklist from that day, from that location of that person. Um, so here's the snow geese. Um, 75 and they put in the notes that the geese were seen flying overhead. But you can see what else they reported. Um, some interesting sightings, some four year Asian widgeons, lots of American widgeons, lots of starlings. Uh, but it's, So it's a good way to see what else was seen. Now when you're on the map um, there's another option that you can look at. Uh, so I'm going to just zoom out a little bit. There's another option over here that says explore rich media. If you check that, um, it will show you records that have uh, photos or video or audio recordings uh, associated with them. So uh, by clicking that, we reduced the number on the map to just one. Um, so there's one that has a photo attached. It's got the P, and here's the legend here, photos, video, or audio. So we can click that, uh, and there, see it has the little camera icon beside the checklist. That means that there's the photo attached to it. And so if you wanted to see that photo, there we go. Yep, those look like snow geese to me. So this is, um, this is a, a handy way people like to explore information. Now you could um, change the date range. So if you wanted to see only show me sightings for this year, you could click that. If you wanted to change it to only show you know, April records, you could do that. You can refine it any way you want. Um, and then just you hit set date range and it'll reduce the number of points to just the ones that meet your criteria. If you wanted to zoom to another location, um, you could type in, um, we could say let's go see what's happening in Victoria. And I'll zoom in and there's no snow goose records for Victoria this year. There's some out over here. Um, so we can have a look. So it's a good way to, to look at the map. If you ever want to see a full, full range of a species, we could hit zoom or uh, full species range and that will zoom the map to show all, uh, all snow goose reports this year because we're still on uh, this year. So I, I like seeing these, these full species maps. Um, they don't show you the points because there's too many points for the for the system to actually display. So instead of showing points, it shows these color-coded squares. And the squares are just basically, the lighter the color, the lower the frequency of reports. So um, remember we were talking about what frequency is. It's the percentage of checklists that are reporting that species. So, and here's the scale. So the light purple are zero to two percent, and then the darkest purple are 40 to 100 percent and then the grayed out areas are areas with no reports. So I, I'm, uh, I'm in Ontario, I'm biased to, towards the east, um, but you can see some, some interesting patterns just looking at this year's information. You can see um, what looks like the darker purple kind of up through the center of the United States. So that's an important flyway for snow geese going through the center of the continent. Um, and then there's this other stretch of dark purple and that's uh, a flyway for the greater snow geese that come up this area. So they winter um, in New England area and they, they head into upstate New York for a bit and then through the eastern end of Lake Ontario and up the St. Lawrence. And if there was, uh, if this went further, we're only in April now, and that's where the, those snow geese are mostly right now they'll end up going much further north to Violet Island. But then you can see it's lighter purple between. This is kind of the area between the two major flyways. So you can get good information just by looking at these maps. And what's, what, I, what I always think is amazing is that these maps and this information is all just inputted by volunteers um, that uh, whether or not it's out of 100% the goodness of their heart or whether it's because they've been, they've been uh, bribed by all these incentives, um, they're still doing a lot of really great work to, 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 um, to keep track of bird records.
So I'm going to go back to explore data. And so we were on the bar charts there, and then we were looking at the maps. And you, if you wanted to just go straight to the maps, you can just click range and point maps. Um, if you want to go straight to the, the frequency graphs, you can hit line graphs. So those are, uh, those are sort of the three big ways to, to look at eBird data, um, the maps or the bar charts or the line graphs. There's a, there's a lot of other ways to explore the information. Um, there's this live submission map. If you're ever looking for a good way to, to fall softly to sleep, you can turn on the live submission map and, uh, and it'll lull you to sleep. It shows you at, in real time when people are submitting information to eBird. So, so far all these gray dots represent places that somebody submitted a checklist today. And I think I'm blocking something here. Uh, usually it will show the number of checklists that have been submitted. But uh, that's that's for when you're looking for time to kill or something. So I'm not going to tell you all the different things you can do with eBird today. That would take too long. Um, but there are these other options. You can look at um, arrival and departure dates for a region. Um, you can look at all time. When the first record of uh, Snow Goose was in Ontario, that's in eBird. You can sign up for different alerts, um, so maybe I will quick show you that. So alerts, I've signed up for all sorts of different alerts. Um, so you can sign up for what are called needs alerts or rare birds alerts, rare bird alerts. Uh, and so needs are to get an email basically from eBird telling you, so for this one, this is Ontario, and I have it set hourly. So if anybody reports a bird in Ontario that I don't have, According to eBird, I'll get an email once an hour to with any new new information. Basically, um, for some areas, you could set it for daily, and you can also set it for birds you haven't seen this year within Ontario. Um, those are the year needs alerts, and then there's the rare bird alerts, which are pretty self-explanatory. Um, if somebody reports a bird that's considered rare by eBird for that region and that date. You can get uh, you can sign up for alerts for that information. So th those are where you would sign up if you wanted um, British Columbia. Okay, we've got uh, Mark Andre has a has a question. So I'm going to unmute this. Okay, go ahead, Mark Andre. That should you should we should be able to hear you. Just a quick question on, on the on the rare bird alert. Um, I, I somewhat signed up for it too, and uh, I get rare bird alerts for like red winged blackbirds and flickers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the the way the rare bird alerts work, um, they are they're rare for the date and location. Oh, okay. uh, but the the other so so if if the if eBird if if the people who are doing the volunteer editing, the reviewing of information, if they set the the data quality filter for an area to say, okay, uh, red winged blackbird, we will flag any record that's that's entered up until February 25th, and then they usually arrive, so then they're here. If you enter a record for February 24th, then it's considered rare by the system. Okay. Now the other the other reason you could get rare bird alerts is um, if somebody enters like a subspecies report. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure in BC what the filters look like, but um, not everywhere do they have the uh, the common subspecies. So they probably do for flicker, I would think um, the red shafted yeah, flicker. Do, yeah, they do for the yellow shafted here. Okay. But um, you know, for instance, there's a there's subspecies of red-winged blackbird, and okay. um, even though it's not rare to see, you know, the red-winged subspecies of red-winged blackbird in British Columbia at this time of year, uh, if it's not on the the expected yeah. list, and somebody goes in and yeah. manually enters it, even though there's nothing wrong with that, um, it could get flagged that way as well. Okay. 
Okay, because because I have another. Well, I mean, it's the same. This this is not for rare bird alert, but maybe I'm I'm jumping the gun here. But for example, uh, red ring neck ducks are quite common in the valley here in the winter, and and sometimes in large numbers. And um, when I enter them, you know, they always get flagged because they're considered as I guess unusual here. Um, is that going to change over time? Like if they see the data is coming in more and more, they they change the. Yeah. So um, I I can quickly. Maybe maybe I'll hold on to the the okay, yeah. fil the filter stuff until we do the yeah. data submission. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but but yeah. uh, you know to quickly answer that, the the filters that work in the background they can be changed really easily. And one of the issues is they cover right now they cover really big areas. So okay. um, yeah. you know a bird could be common and expected in one part of the filter region, but rare in the rest of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, over time, the the filter regions will probably get smaller and more precise. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So th those are the alerts. Um, just to show you quickly how you would sign up for one. Um, so you start typing the area, and it will come up with an option. You click it, and you can you can actually click view uh, if you want, uh, or subscribe. And if you click view, it'll take you to a web page that is uh, the Rare Bird Alert for British Columbia. And you can actually just bookmark this this page and come back to it if you don't want to get email alerts. You can just check it online if you want. Um, so it'll tell you all sorts of um, species. It'll list it by species. You could list it by date. Um, if you click the show all details. Um, you can go down and see if anybody's put any photos. There's a photo. Harris's sparrow. So um, those are the alerts. Um, we don't need to spend any more time on those, I don't think. But that's something that uh, you should be aware of, and it's a it's a fun kind of tool that people use to to help move them up on the top 100 list. Okay, now. Where it starts to get um, quite helpful for for our purposes is you can generate um, lists of high high counts for an area. So let's let's do that. And so we could go in and we could say, show me uh, high counts for um, for Ontario. So we could click entire county or entire country or state province. We could say Ontario counties, and it would bring up the list of counties. Same with hotspots, uh, and then again, same with important bird areas. So, uh, if we wanted to look at high counts for, let's go down to uh, Long Point, and this is the IBA that I'm in right now. Um, we can generate a list of of high counts, and so here we see the date range and it the default is to go back as far as there's information so there's information in eBird for this IBA going back to 1896 and as recently as this year and we so we could uh, we could refine that if we only wanted to see uh, you know this year we could say 2014 to 2014 click submit and it would refresh that um, but then here uh, we're still looking at the the default view and it will tell you you know, Canada goose the high count is four thousand. Tundra swan the high count is eleven and a half thousand. That's one of our trigger species here. Um, American black duck high count is is twelve and a half thousand. That's another one of our trigger species. Uh, what else do we have? Canvasback fifty one thousand. That's another trigger species here. Scop. Uh, you can see we've got a lot of waterfowl here. Red breasted merganser. So it, it will give you that information, and you can change the year you're looking at. So this is a good way to get an idea of, of the information that's available for your IBA. Now, if you want to actually get the information, uh, the raw data out of, out of eBird, you, can, uh, you have two kind of options. The one is to use this download data option under Explore Data. Um, the other option is to use the Nature Counts website. And I'll quickly show you that. So naturecounts.ca. Uh, 
Um, and here you will need to, to uh, register, create a new login. I've already uh, got my information here. Uh, and then we can actually, under download, we can, uh, we can use eBird within this. So under the data set we want to choose, we can click the, the data we want, eBird Canada for Ontario. Uh, we're going to do all species and we're going to add an area. We can, we can specify an IBA here. So if you hit add new, click important bird areas within Ontario, and here we go, long point, add it to our list, transfer it to the form, and there it's ready to go. Now we could say we'll specify a date range. You know, if you only wanted information for the last five years, you could specify that here. Um, and then we would hit search data, and that would be a way to download that information. Now, so there's, there's an easy access to get the eBird data uh, and use it into uh, site summaries. Now, the, the great thing is we're, gonna, we're working on building that part of the IBA Canada website into uh, an automated process. So in the future, you won't have to go and download the information and then upload it um, to IBA Canada. We'll just automatically get the information that's taken out of uh, eBird and other data sets, and it will automatically update the site summary data, uh, bird data tables. So I'll talk a little bit more about that um, a bit in a bit. Um, but we're going to go back to eBird. So there's a lot of ways you can explore the eBird data. It's, it's a tremendous tool to learn about birds, um, where, they are, where they are occurring, and patterns of distribution and abundance, those sorts of things. I didn't even mention uh, these two tools. These are both new. Um, I'll quickly show you those two. The Explore Hotspots is a really neat tool. It starts with this map that shows, um, it starts with showing a map that shows how many species have been reported to eBird. So you can see North America and Europe are the best covered areas for eBird. Um, but you can zoom in and you can see, okay, uh, you know, the, the West Coast has high species richness and there's pretty good number of species in around the Great Lakes and the East Coast as well. Uh, but if you keep zooming in, we'll zoom in on southern BC, you can see, you know, around Vancouver has the highest number of species. You can click on a square and it'll tell you 331 species have been reported there. We're going to keep zooming in and then it's going to show you those hot spots that I keep mentioning. And so those hot spots are color coded for how many species. So if you're if you're planning a trip or planning on going somewhere, you can quickly find out where the the best places to go uh, to see a lot of species are. So if we were going to uh, to Vancouver area, we'd probably want to make a stop at uh, this one here. It's Iona Island. There's 268 species there, uh, and there's been a thousand checklists submitted. And if we brought up the view details we'd have sort of a hub for that, that hotspot. So here we go. Here's the Iona Island hotspot. It gives you um, the list of species that have been seen and when they were last seen, by who. Um, you can go and see when the first records were. You can see high counts for that hotspot. You could go to, uh, to the bar chart for the high spot. And then, you know, then there's the, uh, the incentive tools, the top eBirders. Uh, to see who has seen the most species at that place or submitted the most checklists. So that's the, the Hotspot Explorer. And then the Location Explorer is similar, except it uses uh, countries, provinces, or the counties. So we could say, let's see Metro Vancouver. And it's the same information we just saw, um, but it also, you can look at um, the list of hotspots that fall within Metro Vancouver. So if you knew you were going to be there, you'd see, okay, i got to go to Ion Island, and then the bird sanctuary, maybe this conservation area. Those are some of the, the good places that have seen a lot of species. 
Okay, that's, uh, that's it for exploring eBird data. There's a lot of information there, and uh, I hope you can take advantage of some of that. The next part of this is to, to show you how to use eBird um, to conduct your monitoring. And I expect, I hope this is where, um, I hope a lot of you will have some questions as we're going, so, so don't hesitate to ask. So to submit information into eBird, you've got to click the Submit Observation tab. Okay, now submitting, um, submitting stuff to eBird, um, some people find daunting at first, but it's, it's really actually quite simple if you break it down into the, the steps. So there's three steps, and we're at stage one of the three steps. So the first step is to tell eBird where you were out bird, birding or looking for birds. So there's several different options uh, to choose from. The best option is to use Find It on a Map. And this will take you to a map. You can zoom in and click where you were. Once you've been to a location once, um, then it will sh forever be in your My Location list. So here's my list of all the locations I've been to. I could, um, if I wanted to go to uh, the Long Point area site locations, I would start typing in Long Point. Whoops. So there we go. You can type up to the first three letters of a location name, and here are the different areas within Long Point. So if I knew where I was, what I called those locations, I could click it in my list. Um, but most of the time, probably 99% of the time I submit a checklist, I use Find It on a Map. Now, if you want to uh, just use the coordinates, if you have the latitude and longitude, you can use this option. Uh, and then there's this, this other option here, which is an entire city, county, or state. Um, this isn't advised uh, because this is for really coarse information. Like if you had a list of birds you saw, uh, you know, on a trip to Ontario, and all you wrote down was that you were in Ontario, you could submit it um, for just Ontario. Obviously, that's not very useful information for for eBird. eBird really thrives on spe specific locations of the of the data that's submitted, uh, but you can enter it that way. Uh, and then the third op or the last option here is import data. I'm not going to talk about that unless anybody wants specific stuff. Maybe we can talk uh, afterwards. Uh, but just to be aware, if you have information from uh, past bird watching and it's in some sort of spreadsheet or bird uh, recording software, there's uh, pretty simple ways to import it into eBird. So we're going to use uh, Find It on a Map. So, and that's what I encourage you to use whenever you're out. So when you use Find It on a Map, you need to tell eBird where you were roughly so it can zoom the map in. So um, if you're using eBird Canada portal, it's going to default to Canada. You'll have to type in the province for it to zoom the map to that province. And then it's going to bring up a map. And it's got to load the uh, load the different markers, and you can zoom in uh, the same way we zoomed in on the the previous map. So you can use the plus or the minus. You can use the magnifying glass to to highlight an area, or you can use the wheel on your mouse, which is the, the easiest. So I'm going to zoom in. Now what you're seeing, you're seeing blue and orange uh, plus signs basically. So the, they, when, they're, when they've got these pluses, that means they represent multiple locations. So there you can see it highlighted it and it said there's 22 locations. Um, and then the blue ones are the personal birding locations down here in the, the legend. And the orange ones or red ones, depending on, on where you draw the line between red and orange, uh, is the birding hotspots. So personal locations are things like random places along the road or um, your backyard, places like that that nobody else will really be submitting information for those spots. So we don't need to, to clutter up everybody else's eBird map with, with those personal locations. So I'm going to keep zooming in here. So 
here we go. We're zooming in, and there's Bird Studies Canada headquarters, uh, and there's a marker right there already. So, so, so there's uh, there's the marker there already. It, it's got the flame. That means it's a hot spot. Uh, so we can click it, and it will tell us what it's called. So Bird Studies Canada HQ, that's where I am right now, and that's what I wanted to select. If there wasn't a location there already, uh, it's as simple as zooming in on the map, uh, clicking a point on the map. It'll show up as this green, green spot, uh, and then you can type in a location name for it, and then hit continue. But I'm going to use the, the pre-existing location. Now you should be aware that you can also switch between the map view and the, tattle, the satellite view. So if we hit satellite, we'd zoom in. So you can get an idea where I am right now. This is kind of creepy. I am, I'm like right here, right where my little thumb is. So this is the Bird Studies Canada headquarters property. I'm going to use it as my location. So there we go. That's uh, the first step is done. We're now we've moved on to uh, step number two, and step number two is entering the date and effort information. So um, we need to choose the date. Um, and if it's if it, if you want to use the calendar, you just click this calendar. It'll open up. It'll remind you that today is April sixteenth. Uh, it'll let you know. Okay, you know that was the Sunday. That was Monday. I'm going to submit a checklist for today. So I'll just click the date. It fills in everything for me. Now the next part is of the date and effort is to tell eBird what you were doing. Um, so if you were traveling a distance, uh, walking, driving, um, those sorts of things, biking, uh, you would choose traveling. And if you choose traveling, it's going to tell you you need to enter a start time, you need to enter how long you were out, how far you traveled, uh, and how many people were in your party. So you can see those things are all bold with a red star. Now, on the other hand, if you choose incidental, uh, none of those things are bold with a star. That means you don't need to put any extra information if you choose incidental. So that's, uh, you know, incidental is when you, what you use if you were, you know, um, doing, you were jogging around your neighborhood and you noticed a bird that you wanted to record an eBird, but bird watching wasn't the main thing you were doing um, or you can use incidental if you have old field notes uh, and you didn't record all the information you know maybe you know you were walking around but you didn't record how long you were out or you didn't record how far you went and you have no way of figuring that out then you could enter it through incidental um, because you don't need any of the extra information uh, the third option or I guess the second option is stationary and that's for when you're covering a small area. You know, if you're sitting on your back, your back deck and um, doing a hawk watch or, uh, you know, you just pull up your car to a viewing platform and you stand on the viewing platform and you're counting waterfowl, um, then you could enter stationary, uh, stationary count. And, and there all you need is the start time, how long you were watching, and how many people were in the party. So you, the same information as traveling, except you don't need information about how long or how far you traveled. Now, uh, there's another option here uh, called Other, and that lets you select from a drop-down list. And so there's these other kind of specific protocols, and if you want to if you want to explore those, um, you just click them, and it'll give you a bit more information about them, so you can you can decide if that's what you really wanted to use. Now this is where um, it gets exciting and um, interesting because we're working with eBird to come up with a, a, a protocol in here that's called the eBird Canada protocol. And it'll work, um, it'll work uh, in a special way because it will tag all the checklists that happen by, that are submitted within an IBA in that day. Um, it'll tag them as being using that protocol uh, and that will help us for tallying up uh, the reports for that day. So basically, it'll work kind of like a Christmas bird count, um, where you know you could have you could have several different parties out, 
um, covering different parts of an IBA. And if everybody uses the IBA Canada protocol, um, and we avoid using dupe, uh, counting birds twice. So, you know, if we, if my party goes and covers um, the east part of Long Point, and um, and another party covers uh, the west part of Long Point, and we coordinate to make sure that we didn't double count things, and we use the IBA Canada protocol, it will help us um, just to have an automated system that adds up everything that happened that day uh, and we can get high counts um, and use those for updating the site summary information. So that's something to be aware of. It's not out yet, but hopefully within you know the next month or two that will be an option um, under other um, and there will be a lot more information. When, once that happens uh, we will send out um, we will send out the, the detailed protocol and we'll have an announcement and if you have questions about it then um, we'll be happy to to make sure everybody understands how to use it properly but for now um, we're gonna we're sticking with these uh, these options here the traveling stationary or incidental okay so I'm gonna complete this protocol here for uh, my bird studies Canada headquarters checklist so I'm going to say uh, I got here to the office at 8.30 and I can use 12 hour or I can use 24 hour and one thing nice is eBird will remember what you choose so if you prefer using 12 hour and you enter a checklist with the 12 hour uh, protocol the next time you enter a checklist it'll stick stay with the 12 hour but if you prefer 24 hour like I do uh, then it keeps it that way. Now, there is one person in my party. Here we go. Okay, so Mark Andre, you just asked um, if you notice that a hotspot location is in the wrong place. How can uh, how can you get that changed? Uh, that's a great question. If you if you notice um, if you notice anything um, sort of amiss with eBird, like a location is in the wrong place. Um, it, like a hotspot is in the wrong place or, or anything else that, that needs to be fixed. Um, you can email Dick Cannings if you have his contact information that's great. Uh, if you don't uh, you can email me and I can pass it on to Dick. Uh, he coordinates eBird in Canada and, and in BC as well uh, so he can, uh, he can move that really really simply. Um, okay so going back here um, we've got the information submitted. Now I don't have to actually fill this information in if I didn't want to but but I'm choosing to. All right and then there's a comment section where you know you could put the weather information uh, you can you can input uh, what you were doing so you know I can enter uh, just type in these are just casual observations from my from my desk uh, and so that's step two is done. Okay, now the third and final step is to tell eBird what it was that you saw. So um, you can go through the uh, species list and you can, there's all these, these different options. If you prefer to see your species sorted alphabetically, you can click alphabetic. So there we go. There they're sorted alphabetically. Um, I like to have the subspecies option displayed. See the red-winged red-winged blackbird. Uh, but if you don't like that, you can hide those subspecies. So there, I'll uncheck uh, the sub subspecies. And uh, the the other option is the group by most likely. Uh, so I will uncheck that. And there, they're just you know straight list uh, alphabetically. The group by most likely I find really helpful because it looks at um, the checklists that have been submitted for that location. Uh, so there's 72 checklists submitted for this location at this time of year. Uh, and it will group the species by the most likely species to the least likely species. So here these species here are all frequent. They've been reported on 10% or more of the checklists. Whereas these are infrequent species they're between 0 and 10 percent and then these species haven't even been reported 
uh, in, in this time period. So here you're just going to enter the numbers of how many uh, of each species you saw. Um, you, so as an example, you know, maybe I saw 20 red-winged blackbirds um, and I saw some crows, but I didn't count the crows and I can't even remember roughly how many I saw. So if you don't have a, any idea how many you saw, you can enter an X. And if that's all you wanted to report, you could you could go and, and submit the checklist. So before um, you submit the checklist, you have to answer this last question, which is, are you submitting a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify? So this is basically uh, the check to see, are you excluding species that you saw? So, you know, I saw more than just red-winged blackbirds and crows. I don't want to take the time to report all of those, so I'm going to answer no and submit my checklist. So that is uh, a real, real quick way how to submit the checklist. If you notice that you uh, made mistakes or wanted to add things, you can come back at any time and click Edit Species. And you can say, I saw two crows. And you can add other species in. If you report all the species, then you can change your answer to yes. Now here's where um, we were talking about um, some of the data quality. Um, so say I saw 20 crows, but uh, my finger slipped and I added a whole bunch of extra zeros. If I try to save, it it should, based on the, the filter that works in the background, it should say, whoa, this is a high count. Uh, please, add, please add some comments and then check complete. So if I really did see however many crows that is, 200 million or something like that, uh, I, I could put in the details that, um, yeah, I counted um, every single one uh, as they flew by. So this is an exact count. Or, you know, I, I made an estimate every five minutes how many had gone over. Uh, and then you'd click, you would click the complete button and then hit save. And it would, it would put that record in. Now, if there is a species on here that's, or a species you saw that's not on the list, you would have, you would hit the show rarities button over here and that will bring up any species that are rare. So American Avocet, um, if I tried to enter a count of just one uh, and hit save, it will say, oh, hang on, this bird is rare for this date and location. Please add comments and then check complete. So any of those records that you are asked to confirm, those are records that are triggering the filter that works in the background. Um, and then they're manually sent to, or they're sent to a, a review queue where a volunteer eBird reviewer will go through those records and just double check them. They might contact it, contact you if they have questions about your sighting. You know, if I entered an Abacet, uh the eBird reviewer here might send me an email and say, uh, ask me for more information because I left the, the comment section blank. So I will quickly show you I will quickly show you what those uh, the, those data quality work, how that data quality looks in the background. Um, so here is a filter the filters that work in the background. So for Norfolk County, where we are right here, um, this is this is how they look. So uh, for snow goose, for instance, the filter limit is zero from January 1st to February 26th. Starting on February 27th, there's 10 allowed. So if you see, if you report a checklist, uh, say, you know, April 15th in Norfolk County, you could report 10 snow geese. But if you report 11 snow geese, then it will flag it as a, as a high count. And it will ask for more information and it will be, it will enter the manual review stage. If you, on February 20th, enter a checklist and you have just one snow goose, it will flag it as a rare species and ask for more information about it that way. And that's how it determines what species are rare for those rare bird alert um, emails that go out. Okay, so I'm going to hit save for this checklist. 
So one of uh, one of the questions that I know has come up a lot uh, with eBird and using it for monitoring at IBAs is figuring out what scale to report your your sightings for. So um, let's use Longpoint as an example again. Um, so I'm going to hit submit. We're going to use find it on a map. And we'll zoom in to, uh, to Norfolk County again, to Long Point. Now, a lot, of, a lot of the time when you're out serving um, in an IBA, you're going to make, you know, let's, using Long Point as an example, we're, we're, we're serving for waterfowl a lot of the time to, to get an idea how many water, or, uh, how many water birds there are using the area. So um, the best way to go about it is to uh, make a separate count at each spot you stop. So you know, maybe I start over here at the west end of, of Long Point and I look, use the lookout here. Okay, thanks Catherine. Um, so um, I might use this this section here, make a count here, um, and then you know I make another count somewhere along here, somewhere over here. Now the the best thing is to submit each individual spot you stop as a separate um, checklist, but that's not always possible, and that's okay. Um, you you could um, you could plot a new location. Say we were driving from from this point to this point, and we you know, saw five five hundred geese fly over. We could we could use one. Um, we could enter a, a checklist location. Um, we could plot a new spot, and we could say uh, Lakeshore Road. So we could give it a new name based on where it is, and we could submit it that way. Uh, we could also submit information um, for each individual location. It's it's up to you how much effort you're willing to put into um, into the the data collection. Obviously, it's better if it's really fine scale, but that's not always possible. So the great thing is, though, whether or not you use uh, very fine scale reporting locations or you use you know one or two general locations that cover a big chunk of the IBA uh, as long as you're using the IBA Canada protocol in the future we'll be we'll be adding all those individual checklists together to figure out how many individuals were present within the IBA uh, and so that's how we're going to be using it in the future are there any questions about submitting information into eBird All right. Um, I promised you I would mention there is um, there's an app for entering data. So so there is if you want to use your if you have an Android phone or an iPhone um, and you want to uh, be recording your notes in the field, you can you can enter basically directly into eBird using. Uh, this app called Bird Log. Now, where are we? Oh, this is Bird's Eye. Here we go. So, Bird Log. And this is the only app that supports direct um, direct eBird data submission. And it's handy because you can use uh, you can use Bird Log even if you're not connected to uh, a network. You can save a checklist. You can enter the, all the same information you would do using eBird. Uh, you save it on the uh, on Bird on your phone, and then when you come home and you have internet connection or you're back in cell service range, it will submit the information and go into your eBird account. So it's pretty straightforward to use. I haven't used it a whole lot, um, but a lot of people use it. A, a big percentage of eBird now is is entered using BirdLog. And there's these different versions. Um, you'd want BirdLog North America to make sure you have all the, the options here for, for North America. Okay. Um, 
All right, and I, I pretty much covered already how to access the eBird data. Um, we were talking about using the high counts on eBird. You can download directly through eBird or use nature counts to, to download the information. But it's important to remember that in the fairly near future, we'll, uh, we'll be in, in implementing the tools so that um, anything that's submitted to eBird will go, it goes automatically now to nature counts. And same with the breeding bird atlas data, same with uh, nocturnal owl survey data. There's a lot of data that goes automatically to nature counts. And all of that information that's available in nature counts will be, uh, will be automatically used to update the bird data tables. So uh, as a refresher, where are we? Trying to find the right tab. So these bird data tables here. Um, now if we clicked show all records, these will automatically include any records that are in eBird or anywhere else in Nature Counts that um, go over the threshold for that species or come close to it. So you don't, you don't need to really worry about getting information out uh, of Nature Counts unless you want to look at the raw data and, and work with, with the raw data, but we will be doing these automatic site summary updates in the, in the near future. Um, so that'll be a big improvement and a big help, I'm sure, to all of you um, because you've got enough things on your plate already as it is. So um, that's, that's pretty well it. Um, are there any other questions that anybody has about eBird or, uh, or anything I mentioned today?